Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to another Wednesday night fellowship and study here at St. James's. My name is Reverend Hilary Strever, and I'm the Senior Associate Rector here. It is um, my delight to welcome Greg Kimball, Dr. Greg Kimball. He is the Director of Public Services and Outreach at the Library of Virginia. He um, is also a historian in particular of Richmond, antebellum Richmond, um, and he is the author of American City, Southern Place, A Cultural History of Antebellum Richmond. He has other interests as well, and as we mentioned earlier on in our fellowship hour, um, he's a musician and does a lot of traditional music, so he's just a fascinating person, and it's a delight to have him here. Now, why did we invite Greg Kimball here tonight? Well, back last year, as a part of the presiding bishop's call to becoming beloved community, um, we, a group of parishioners just wanted to start digging into their own past and their own gene genealogies to see you know, what what were some of the untold stories? What were the, where were the slave censuses? Did they have family members who owned slaves? Were there other untold stories that they wanted themselves to be aware of so that they could um, take stock and repent of what needed repenting, celebrate what needed celebrating, and, and begin to wrestle with some of those harder questions? Well, once they began digging into their own stories, they, they began to wonder, um, well, what about our church history, you know, the, the the history of the Christian church in general and in the United States, but more specifically the Episcopal Church and even more specifically St. James's. So this group of amateurs decided to just start digging into old records, vestry minutes, um, sermons, that sort of thing. And they've come up with their first part of their history that covers 1830 to 1865. They'll be presenting this, their findings, in two weeks uh, as part of this series. But we realized we couldn't, they couldn't present their findings without us having a better understanding of what was going on, not just in Richmond, but also in the Episcopal Church. So Dr. Kimball is here tonight to talk about the same time period uh, in Richmond. And next, next Wednesday night, we'll hear from the uh, historian of the Episcopal Church, Dr. Ed Bond, um, who will speak uh, the same time period, what was happening in the church. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kimball, and, um, and he'll speak for a little while, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. So I'll ask everybody, if you don't mind, go ahead and mute yourselves, just in case there's a dog barking in the background or whatever. <laughs> we all have those moments. All right, Dr. Kimball, take it away. Oh, we can't hear you. I got to mute myself. I was doing good. Um, yes, for just um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and um, I'm glad to be here, of course. Uh, Richmond really has been my passion. I've been here 35 years and invested a lot of time in trying to unravel the stories uh, in the city. I'm going to share my screen with you because I, I really love, want you to see what the city looked like in the period that we're talking about. I love to teach through images and sound. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'll make sure we get it to pop up here. And we'll start looking at some images and sort of taking them apart piece by piece here. Let me share that and let's see, we're gonna from the beginning. So I did, I call them, just like my book, I called it American City Southern Place. And that has a really specific meaning for me. And, and that is really simply that um, Richmond was like a lot of other American cities on the East Coast. It had fraternal orders and the Masons and the Odd Fellows, and it had temperance societies, and it had militia companies, and it had all of the things that you'd expect in a classic antebellum city like New York or Philadelphia. But it also was very Southern. And I, the, I'll just quickly say the reasons I say that are, one, 
to some degree, Richmond was more a creature of its, of its um, hinterland, of its uh, surroundings, of the agricultural society that it was part of. It also, of course, as we know, um, uh, had a really, in many ways, a very unique system of slavery that developed in the city. And we will talk about that as well. So it's kind of these contradictions that the city has. And many people who came to the city, you know, everybody from Thackeray uh, to um, um, Charles Dickens recognized quickly these kind of apparent contradictions in the landscape and the society that was here. This image in some ways really encapsulates this contradiction. This is a painting by an English artist, the Iron Crow, yeah. who accompanied um, uh, Thackeray on a lecture tour that he gave in America. And he was an artist, obviously. And um, he took this scene of, of enslaved people who are being loaded onto a railroad car um, to be transported south after sale. And yet in the background, what do we see? We see the Capitol, you know, this, this icon of liberty. Uh, that's a contradiction a lot of people commented on. You see a factory sitting right behind the folks that are in the cart. This was a, a very industrial city, very unusual for the American South. Um, so to me, this image it almost visually uh, reads about this, this very strange thing that Richmond was. Just want to quickly start, we'll go a little bit earlier than 1830, because it is important to recognize that obviously Europeans and Africans weren't the first people who were living uh, in the place that we none now call Virginia or Richmond. And of course, this is the famous uh, map of John Smith, um, which laid out his understanding of the native peoples that lived in the area around here. And one way to connect that with the history we will be talking about is um, the fall line, and of course, that's why Richmond is where it is, is because it's where the river falls somewhere between 185 feet down to the tidewater. And Europeans recognized that was important, and we'll talk about why it was important. For Native Americans, uh, it was important because, one, you had rock outcroppings. Uh, my friend Tim Thompson, who uh, unfortunately has passed on, was an archaeologist for the Flood Wall Project, found many uh, tool making sites along the along the fall line area where he they would be building as he was doing his archaeology where, where they would build the flood wall because those rock out outcroppings were perfect places to have tool making sites another was of course the runs of, of shad and other uh, fish that would come up the river and be trapped in weirs so this was a place of nourishment uh, it was an important place and it was also the fault line between the Monacans to the west and the various tribes who were aligned with Powhatan. So it had a real impo a seriously important meaning to the Native Americans. And of course, it would also have an important meaning for European and, and Africans who settled here. You know, the founding of Richmond, you can't avoid uh, talking about William Byrd of Westover, um, who was uh, uh, obviously one of the most wealthy uh, uh, per people in the colony and who laid out the original plan of the city uh, in the 1730s. And then this ticket, this lottery ticket, is actually from his son, William Byrd III, uh, whose estate uh, Belvedere sat basically where Oregon Hill is today. And they both uh, conducted these open lotteries for the land uh, as it was laid out. So the original layout of the city uh, was was basically the, the the square blocks that the birds laid out. Richmond was a very rough place. You have to remember um, the settlement of Virginia didn't go all that far west. <laughs> so when it was founded as as a town in 1742, it was just some warehouses, um, and it it was still a pretty rough looking place by the time of the Revolution. Um, this is a map that, as you can see, uh, uh, an officer named Simcoe uh, documented uh, in his journal. Uh, he was with the Queen's Rangers during the Revolutionary War. 
And of course, there was they invaded Virginia and and uh, they took Richmond. And you can see this is his sketch. A couple things to note here is, you know, you have a fairly small number of buildings that are sort of clustered around. Not a lot is built. And then you have that topography. Now, if there's anything you can say about early Richmond, it had lots of ravines <laughs> and, and hills. The t we think today that that topography is there, but believe me, it was much more extreme. A lot of the land in downtown Richmond was filled in uh, to a degree that's really quite remarkable. I mean, you there was the Shaco Creek, for instance, at the at that bay uh, of um, Broad Street before you rise back up into Church Hill. That that was impassable during parts of the year. So one of the huge things that happened to make Richmond what it is today is, of course, the moving of the Capitol uh, uh, General Assembly in 1779, votes on it, moves in 1780, and, of course, the construction of Jefferson's uh, uh, Temple of Liberty, uh, the, the Virginia State Capitol, over a period of years in the 1880s. And what does the Capitol bring with it? Of course, it brings uh, accountants, so well, bookkeepers, I guess we would say, uh, lawyers like, uh, you know, like Marshall and Wickham and people who, who, and printers, people who serve government. And so you start to see the acceleration of the city as, as a real kind of substantial place. This is a wonderful view by uh, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, beautiful watercolor that he did. So here we're looking from the Rockets area westward. And of course, the Capitol would have been the most, by far the most prominent thing one would see. And you see the cluster of houses. You know, again, you get that sense of kind of how rough this place was. Um, this is probably in the 1790s. Latrobe actually built the state penitentiary, uh, which was a huge reform uh, thing that was being done at that time. Very progressive for its time. So we go from 1790, where there's 3,760 odd people in Richmond, 18th largest city in the United States. By 1810, there are almost 10,000 people. So basically, you know, almost triples. And it's the 12th largest place in the United States. So this, this is really a boom period. There's some beautiful architecture. You know, we have, of course, um, built on the location of the, of the theater fire, um, monumental church. It didn't quite look like this in the end. <laughs> this, this, this is a little, uh, maybe a little, uh, what's the right word, um, fanciful rendering of it. Um, uh, but beautifully uh, done by Robert Mills and the old city hall. This is the first city hall. Uh, which also has this very beautiful neoclassical design. But, and you know, of course, then you have, like I said, you have people of means who are coming to do business with government. Uh, you have the Wickhams and the Brockenbros and many of the other names of, of note. But you also have little tiny cottages. Um, uh, one of these gamble roof cottages was, was occupied in the 1790s by a uh, free person of color named Abraham Skipwith, who left a will with a fairly substantial amount of property. Uh, we'll get into this whole conversation about what, what does it mean to be a free person of color in a society that is largely dominated by the, the institution of slavery. It's kind of a strange idea. We'll get into that a little bit later. But if you're just walking around, these are the kinds of houses that you would see. Small, one, maybe one or two rooms uh, with a lean-to addition would be very common. The other thing is, just geographically, the city grew tremendously. So that little patch that says 1742 is the original city. Uh, and all of these are annexations that came later. Um, by the time of the Civil War, Richmond's still not a very large place. Belvedere Street is roughly the western limit of the city. Everything beyond that's Henrico County. You know, the big sweeping corner on Main Street down by Poe's Pub, that's the eastern end of the city. Um, it's a walking city. You know, there's no subway. There's no mass transportation. People have to walk to the places where they labor. 
And with all of these things happening, eventually, of course, people who want to uh, have commerce, they start to think about transportation. And so they start building the canal, which starts in the 1780s. Um, uh, and eventually will extend about 200 miles to the west to Lynchburg. And then on the eastern end of the city, a set of locks that go down to the great ship lock where so many of you probably have been. This is a great image because, you know, you have the cows and it's very bucolic, right? But pretty soon, Richmond's not going to look that bucolic. <laughs> it's it's going to be smoky and dirty and smelly. Again, a beautiful Latrobe image. So this is roughly down by where the Vepco plant used to be. I think it's like apartments now. So around the Browns, a little bit east of the Browns Island area. And this is one of the first mills that was built on the Falls of the James. And flour is incredibly important to the de development of the city. Um, now tobacco was king, of course, in the, in the uh, colonial period. Uh, but very quickly, a lot of the land in the eastern part of Virginia got worn out because tobacco uh, agriculture was really damaging to the soil. And so you had people like Washington who started experimenting with, with mixed agriculture. Um, and the one thing the tobacco didn't really, really require, Virginians were always trying to start cities in like the 18th century. And they, and they actually had, we have designs of cities, lay, you know, layouts of cities in our collection that never existed because they didn't really need cities. You know, they would pack their tobacco into hogsheads, they'd ship it off their docks. They didn't need a central place. Now, once they had inspection and taxation, yes, then you start to see tobacco warehouses and you start to see a little centralization. The reason flour really is a driver is that you need a lot of it to make any money. It's a volume business where tobacco has a very high per unit cost, uh, saleable cost, uh, um, flour isn't. And so you're moving all this flour from Western Virginia, eventually from the valley into the city, and you're starting to build these bigger and bigger mills to, to grind that flour because you can't transport it raw. It has to be processed. And guess what? What do you need for a, a flour mill? You need iron industries to build the machinery. You need coopers to build the, the hogsheads thousands and thousands of them, of the barrels that you need. You need all these auxiliary industries. And so flour is a real economic driver of the city. And this is what you would see in the period we're talking about. So this one on the left is actually uh, Manchester, which of course was a separate city until the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And we see in the foreground, the Dunlop flour mill, and again, a diversification the, the building with the cupola that's to the right is actually a cotton mill from the 1820s. Uh, and so Manchester was very aptly named <laughs> after Manchester, England. Um, on the right, we see the famous Gallego Mill. And um, it sat right on the Great Basin, this large basin, uh, turning basin in the middle of the city. The Hacksall Crenshaw Mill is also a very, very important mill. And in the foreground, you see part of that lock system that would step down eventually into the eastern end of the canal to take that flower on its way out to eventually Australia, South America, all over the place. Richmond was hands down the largest flower milling center in the world in this period. Another thing that most people don't really have a clue about is coal mining in the immediate Richmond region. Now, if you go roaming down in the Midlothian area, you'll start to realize what it was there. There's not a lot of, of um, existing structure to, to kind of give you an idea about that. Uh, most of it is, is disappeared. Um, once in a while, a hole will appear in, in somebody's yard, and you can tell there was a coal mine <laughs> there once. Um, and, uh, but it was a really important coal uh, field, and in the 
you know, particularly the early, the 1810s, 20s, Virginia was a fairly major net exporter of coal. Um, and of course, this is again, also influences the, um, uh, the iron industry because you need fuel. So you can also see in this map, another thing that's happening, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about it, you see railroads. So we got the Richmond and Petersburg, the York River, Richmond and Danville. Richmond had, uh, was a major rail center, bigger than any other in the South. And then iron industry. So in the foreground of it, so now we're standing up where, um, you know, I've been around long enough to say Ethel headquarters, but now, what is it now? New Market <laughs> up on Gamble's Hill. And you're looking down across the canal, uh, transportation canal, but it also is being used to turn wheels, water wheels in all of these factories you see. On the left is the old manufacturer of arms, which was the state armory. Um, that building with the stacks in it, right in the middle, that's uh, a rolling mill, an iron rolling mill. And then um, the building to the far right is a flour mill. So the, right just on one site, you've got all of these industries happening because uh, there's water power. Oh, and I should also point out that bridge, that is the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad Bridge. It's the oldest railroad bridge um, in the city. And you can still, of course, see the pilings for it. They're still there in the river. And here's Tredegar right after the Civil War. Uh, of course, everybody knows it as the, um, you know, quote unquote, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact term people use for it, um, arsenal for the Confederacy. But of course, it existed long before the Confederacy. So it gets started in the 1830s. One of the interesting things is it is named Tredegar because of a group of uh, Welsh workers who came from, and I won't pronounce it right, if anybody's British that's on here, you can correct me later. <laughs> but in Wales, it's something like Tredegar. And so they brought these Welsh iron workers over because they, this was a kind of skill, particularly the high end, what they call puddling and a kind of processing of iron into wrought iron that was highly, highly skilled and valued. And these guys just basically carried it around in their heads. Um, so you really needed these British workers to come over to start any kind of a major ironworks. So there's a really significant Welsh significant, uh, you know, uh, influence. And then of course, other British, Scottish, um, you know, English workers who worked at these, at these mills. But Schrodinger also has a story of African-American labor that we'll get to later and we'll talk about a strike that happened there in 1847. And here's a great description of Tredegar in 1853 uh, from the Richmond Dispatch. You know, I don't think the, any modern um, chamber of commerce could write anything better than this <laughs> because, you know, Southerners, they realized they were kind of in a race for their life uh, versus Northern industry. And so they were, you know, there were a lot of people in Virginia who understood that if they didn't get with it, that they, they were going to lose out in terms of developing uh, industry and markets. One of the things that really um, uh, uh, frustrated uh, Virginians was that many of their goods got retransported through New York and then overseas. And uh, they struggled to try to find a way to break New York's stranglehold over some of that trade. And of course, here you see uh, the Tredegar Ironworks, a, a piece from our collection. Uh, we have the papers of, of Tredegar. This is a great quote from a fellow named Jefferson Wallace, a young man living in Richmond. He's writing to his brother, Charlie, who's living at that point has gone out in the California gold rush. And he's, he's trying to describe what, how Richmond is changing um, before his very eyes. Uh, by the way, their father's name was William Wallace, which I absolutely love. <laughs> and he was a Scottish immigrant. Um, so yeah, I mean, he can just see day by day the transformation, not only of the physical landscape, but also the, all these new people flowing into the city. Like this was a happening place. Uh, you know, it, it was it was a going going concern. 
I just put this in to give a little Virginia context. So it, it shows manufacturing establishes, as you can see by county. Obviously, Richmond is that big black you know area in in uh, and Henrico County as well in in the eastern part of the of the state. The other ones are out in the valley, which is kind of interesting. Uh, people out there were also uh, really starting to industrialize. So by 1860, the value of Richmond's manufacturing output ranked at 13th in the United States. And that is despite only having 20, uh, only ranking 25th in population. So this, this, you know, economically, this was a pretty powerful manufacturing city. This is my favorite map of this period, and it's very detailed. And I, I wish I could give you, like, a, let you actually read the whole thing. It was actually included in, in the Ellison Atlas of 1856. Uh, uh, it was actually, a, um, what you call it, a city directory. And so you would get this with your book. So if you're a new, you know, you came in on the railroad from, from Washington and you came to the station on, on the Richmond Petersburg, I mean, Richmond Ferguson Potomac Railroad, you might stop by and buy one of these books and it would give you this long list of sites to see, including almost all of the major churches, all the manufacturing places, all of, you know, pretty much everything you'd want to see in the city. Another thing, again, I love about this is you see the topography. You can see very clearly the Shaco Valley coming down to that dock area, right? And you see the profile, that very kind of irregular profile of Church Hill on the uh, sort of middle right of the image. And then, of course, over here on the, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more a closer view here. You see over here Belvedere Hill on the far left. We'd call that Oregon Hill now, um, but, and then you see, of course, Gambles Hill, just above Tredegar, and then the canal system. This is a great view of the, how, how complicated this, this canal system was. And of course, up at the top, you can see the Capitol on Broad Street. So here's, here's a, a, obviously a modern map that shows um, the railroads in 1850 and 1861. And as you can see, there was a, a huge amount of, of progress made railroad-wise in the 1850s uh, in Virginia generally, but in Richmond specifically. Um, there's starting to be a system in the South, but it's pretty, um, you know, it's not all connected. Whereas you can see the northern part of the map is highly connected. You know, this is pretty remarkable. Again, you have a, almost tripling of railroad uh, mileage in just a matter of 10 years. So um, I've told you how, you know, industrial the place is and, you know, just imagine the smells of a tannery, which believe me, was really nasty down in Shackle Bottom or, or those smokestacks that never really stopped uh, uh, with coal smoke billowing out of them at Tredegar. And then the smell of tobacco, which I remember very distinctly when I first <laughs> moved to Richmond uh, in, in 1986, you know, and what you're really smelling a lot of that was the sweetener that was put on it, plug tobacco at that time. Here's the gentleman. This gentleman is, um, I, I'm, I have to imagine this a little, but I think he's probably been at the state fair to show off uh, some of his uh, produce. And he's quite proud, obviously, of himself and, and what he's done. And Again, as I said earlier, even though Richmond's industrial, it's still very tied to the countryside. A lot of these industries we're talking about, flour, tobacco, they're still rooted in agricultural production and reprocessing. Um, a big part of that is the tobacco industry. And um, this building, which still stands, I think it is condos or something, 
or apartments um, was Polig Brothers Manufacturing. I remember going in there with Mr. Polig many years ago. Um, but originally, this in 1853 was built as a tobacco factory. And here's where we start can start to talk a little bit about sort of the unusual labor system that was employed in the city during this time. This uh, building had around 90 um, enslaved African American men working in it. And uh, that was actually a fairly typical um, setup in the tobacco manufacturing industry. Um, so just as, again, an example, here's some numbers from this. They sent a reporter down from New York uh, from Hunt's Merchants Magazine in 1858. And they went around and they tried to see, okay, what's going on in Richmond that we need to know about? Um, and they find 53 factories and uh, more than 4,000 enslaved men working in factories. By 1860, more than half of those men are not owned by the manufacturer. They are hired from their masters to work in these factories. And this is where we start to get into the terrain of what's going on. How can, why are masters doing this? Well, one reason they're doing it is because they have, just to put it in, I, I know kind of baldly uh, economic terms, they have excess labor. Um, the, the population of enslaved people in Virginia has grown tremendously. And there are two outlets for that. One is to hire your enslaved people into these growing industries in Richmond. The other is to sell them into the slave trade, in the domestic slave trade. And that is a very, very important part of uh, Richmond's uh, um, landscape. So here we have a document from our collection from, I believe this is 1852 two or five from James P. Hargrove. And you can see what he's done. He's actually printed a form that he can fill out to let people know that he trades with, uh, many of them probably in the deep South, particularly New Orleans. And he's essentially giving them intelligence on how much different, um, literally number one, number, you know, girls of a certain height, are, are selling for in the Richmond market. Um, that's, you know, it's, it doesn't get any more in your face than this, right? In terms of this is a business. I have a friend uh, down at uh, University of Alabama who I went to graduate school with, um, uh, Josh Rothman, who's getting ready to uh, publish a book that will really talk about um, how this became a very, very organized and grimly efficient uh, business. We think that probably about a half million people were sold out of the Upper South into the Deep South uh, during the late antebellum period. One of the signs, so, so I.R. Crow, when he comes with Thackeray to Richmond, he gets intrigued by seeing these ads in the, in the paper. And one of the things he notices is that the sign of a sale going on is a red flag that gets put out in front of the auction house. And most of these houses were down in the area where today we know the Lumpkins Jail archeological site is roughly uh, around the area of where the, you know, the uh, Main Street Station, uh, roughly that area around 14th Street. And of course, many of these people were sent into the New Orleans trade because that was where they would then be resold into Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, you know, the, the basically the cotton south. So it's, it's this enormous international um, business that's going on because, of course, where's that cotton go? It goes to New England into the mills or to England into the mills. This is becoming part of an international economy, but it's a brutal one. And you can see here, this is actually a um, a punishment uh, piece that would be put kind of almost welded onto around the neck of uh, someone who tried to escape. Um, this one actually has an amazing provenance. 
It's at the Massachusetts Historical Society. A Massachusetts soldier cut it off the neck of a woman who was imprisoned uh, at a plantation that his uh, cavalry unit um, took over. And he cut this off her neck and he mailed it to the governor of Massachusetts. This is from uh, uh, Crow's book. It's called um, With Thackeray in America. And then um, this is his painting that he called Slaves Waiting for Sale that he made from that sketch. Um, I remember this so vividly showing this. We, we displayed this painting along with Crow's other existing art uh, an exhibit here at the library. And we, sh we knew these were gonna be very powerful images, of course, as they are, and we showed them to you know, a select uh, group of Richmonders that we wanted to see how people, you know, this is heavy stuff. So we said, and, and tried to get their sense of how they would react to them. The almost universal reaction from African-Americans was that can't, they can't be slaves because look at how they're dressed. And look at the woman with her child. And we had a good conversation about that. And we said, well, think about it. We actually do know that they dress people very well because they were property to be marketed. And there were people who actually specialized in clothing and slave people for sale. Um, it, again, this business was really well articulated. Um, what is the woman doing? Why is she smiling, that one woman? Well, she's got her child. You can imagine she's trying to distract her from what's actually ha going to happen to them very soon after this image is, is, is done. So um, it's fascinating. Um, one thing I've learned in this business is you don't assume anybody can read an image from the 19th century because you can't. You have to understand why the image is the way it is. And the man in the, off to the side is such a powerful image to me. Um, one other really grim part of this, of this traffic, and, I, and it really, you know, we ought to talk about this really as human trafficking, because that's what it is, um, is that there was a trade in what they call fancy girls. And that basically meant uh, young women who would be sex, sexually exploited. This woman, Fanny Berry, was interviewed in the 1930s by the WPA projects. Um, uh, they did a rather remarkable thing. And one of the really ironies in Richmond, in Virginia was that one of the main, inter most of the main interviewers were actually African-American, which was not true in most states. And in many ways, I think they got much more honest testimony in Virginia than they would have gotten in some other places. But here she, you can see that uh, this is Fanny Berry describing a slave sale um, that she witnessed. One thing that's consistent in these descriptions is the, is, is the examination of the person. You can see it ends, fine young wench. This is a really interesting one. This is a, a Jewish immigrant named Philip Whitlock who went on to found a important tobacco company here in Richmond. He came in the 1850s. Um, uh, I believe he's originally from Eastern Europe, but he came through, uh, came through Germany, which would have been, you know, pretty uh, typical, um, and came came here. And this is his account from his diary of witnessing uh, a slave sale, which to someone like, you know, it must have been mind blowing for somebody uh, from that his background to see this occurring. And, and you see a subtle hint of what he describes in this image, right? Notice how the man in front is sort of getting ready to lift the woman's dress. And see the man on the other side? Why do you think he's examining his back? You, anyone purchasing an enslaved person would do that to see if they've been whipped a lot. In other words, were they troublesome? And as I think you know, uh, Virginia had still, despite the trade, had the largest uh, 
population of enslaved people in the United States uh, by the time of the Civil War. So the darker elements in this map show higher densities, essentially, of uh, enslaved people in the different counties. And not surprisingly, <clears throat> it diminishes as you go west. Um, I think we can logically uh, set, uh, think about that and realize why there is now West Virginia. Uh, there was always a tension between Westerners and uh, Easterners. And a lot of it had to do with slavery, not necessarily as a moral issue, but about taxation and representation. Now, of course, there were people that, um, that decided they were not going to be enslaved anymore. And one of the most famous was Henry Box Brown, uh, who got a white shoe, shoemaker uh, and a, a, a free person of color to put him in a box and literally shipped him to Philadelphia. Um, and uh, not only does it tell you that this is a man that had incredible spunk and um, uh, fortitude, uh, but it also tells you something about the transportation system because he got put on his head, he got put on a steamship, he got moved any number of times because a lot of these uh, infrastructures didn't actually match up. They, you had to offload and then reload. And so the, the, just the fact that he actually survived this trip is really quite remarkable. He would go on to be, ergo the song, a well-known abolitionist speaker in the North and then in England. So let's talk about Richard Paul. Who was here in, in this period of time? So this is a chart from my book. Um, so we see 1850, and I've broken it down between white and black. And I, Realize the term mulatto was a legal definition, okay, of the time. Um, that's not my language. That's how people were classified. And it had to do with a admixture of white and black, uh, which also probably should tell us something. Um, but we see over here native, foreign born, and then a total of the white population, slave free total population. Look at those percentage gains between 1850 to 1860, what jumps out at you? I think probably, I hope, is that foreign born one. 135% growth in 10 years of the foreign born population in Richmond. Richmond was on its way to becoming much more like Baltimore or Pittsburgh than Savannah or Charleston with this very large uh, immigrant population. Uh, in fact, I would say uh, Richmond probably in this next in the forthcoming census will finally reach the level of immigrant population that was achieved in 1860. Um, and not, not to say, by the way, that weren't immigrants in other southern cities because there were, uh, particularly places like uh, New Orleans is a good example. But again, the industrialization is part of this. Uh, there are Germans, there are Irish, there are other people coming into the city. On the other side, we see a fairly small number of people, uh, growth in the free uh, African-American population. Many of those people are leaving. They're going to Philadelphia, New Bedford, and all and into the north. Um, the slave population is, is increasing, but not as dramatically as, in fact, the white population. So what kinds of things were African-Americans doing in the city beyond the industrial stuff that we've talked about? Um, many, many African-American women, of course, they worked in, uh, in domestic service, in white households. And one of the ironies, I think, of antebellum Richmond is that, you know, racial control wasn't based on uh, segregation as it would be in the late 19th century and, and 20th century in the South. Um, in fact, in many ways, white and black people live very close to each other. Um, you know, um, somebody in an urban household would probably live in kind of in this, often in kind of outbuildings just behind the, the main house. And they would interact with the children. They would be the main care group, uh, givers. Uh, in a, and we're talking now about middle class to upper class families, of course. These are... Uh, uh, this is uh, Sally Gladman and um, Henry Page, who were um, 
uh, enslaved by the Valentine family and were, uh, he was the, uh, their carriage driver. Sally Gladman was, was a nurse. Um, so they, you know, they're here in the city doing domestic work. And a lot of artisans uh, like Gilbert Hunt, who's one of the most iconic characters in Richmond history, um, he's a blacksmith. And you have people in the buildings, tr building trades who are sometimes working side by side, you know, with white working men and immigrants in these trades. Um, it's really in the late antebellum period, you start to see white workers start to rebel against the presence of black workers in their, in their uh, skills and professions. Let's talk a little bit about the church. Um, I don't want to step on uh, Ed's uh, terrain too much because you can't have anybody better than him in terms of talking about particularly Episcopal history. But um, obviously the vast majority of African Americans were, were Baptists. And although of course we have Third Street Bethel AME, um, the AME church um, didn't have quite the hold it had here that it had in places like Philadelphia. This quote is from a woman named Frederica Bramer, who really had to have been one of the most radical reformers uh, uh, in the in the mid 19th century. She's from, from uh, Sweden. She was a women's right advocate. Um, and she, like again, many Europeans did this tour of America. And this is a, a quote from her book um, talking about this strange experience she had where she went to the African church, which we see in our image here. Um, there's a building there now, but it's not this building. Uh, this was the original building that housed both the white and black congregation before the white congregation moved up the street and built a new building. So this became an all African-American congregation in 1841. And she's sitting here. This happened to be the largest place you could, it, 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 this, this church had almost 3,000 members. And it was one of the biggest halls in the entire city. And so she goes to this reading of the Declaration of Independence and she, her mind is blown. She's like, this is crazy. These people talking about freedom, you know, and what are we, and we're in this church. That's, you know, vast majority of the people in it are, are enslaved. Don't these people get it? You know, like what's the problem? I think this is one of the things that I cannot stress enough People have an enormous capacity, <laughs> and we do it too. We look, you know, it's easy to look back on these folks and say, what was wrong with these people? But you know what? There are lots of things going on in the world right now. What are we doing about them? Probably not a lot, the vast majority of us. It's easy to judge in retrospect, but that's what she, she just can't understand how this is happening. People have an enormous capacity to not see what they do not want to see. This gentleman has obviously been somewhat controversial in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Robert Ryland, who was the minister at First African Baptist Church, and of course also associated with Richmond College. Um, and I put these together because one of the most interesting things that I read in my research was Robert Ryland got together with 24 African American deacons every week to conduct the business of the church. And um, you know, he's just a fascinating character. Uh, you know, there's plenty, you know, everyone would have to make their own moral judgment about him. Um, but, and, and one of those, tr one of those uh, trustees was Gilbert Hunt. <laughs> he, he was, and he was kind of a cantankerous guy. He, he um, was not uh, shy about challenging um, uh, things that Robert Ryland did in the church. Um, so it's just a very, it's an it's interesting story. And so there's obviously, you know, we know Ryland, you know, he writes a catechism for African Americans because, you know, he wants to quote the parts of the Bible about obeying your masters, etc. On the flip side, um, there's this incredible moment where he's uh, getting, he gets mail for his congregation and he hands out these letters to people without reading them. He just gives them, you know, it's addressed to someone, so he gives it to them. Well, it turns out some, a master discovers uh, that uh, one, that this, his enslaved person um, 
has gotten a letter that's from somebody who's run away and is telling him how to do it. And Robert Ryland gets into serious trouble. And he basically says, it's not my business. I can't survive as a minister of this congregation if I do that. Like, like there's, there is got to be some kind of trust here, okay? So he's a really troublesome character. You know, he, he is an enslaver. Yes. Is he a racist? Yes. By our standards, absolutely he is. But I don't know what to tell you. It's a tough one. Um, so one thing I think I want to point out here about churches too, this situation we have in Richmond and some of the other bigger cities like Petersburg and Alexandria and places like that, where you have a, these split congregations, that's actually pretty unusual. In the countryside, the churches are almost always going to be one church. Now, they'll have segregated seating and sometimes in various ways. There are uh, ex there are um, there are former enslaved people who talk about having to stand outside the windows to hear the preaching. And of course, they have their own ways of, of, of uh, conducting services. They have brush arbor meetings, secret meetings that they go to at night so that they can uh, worship in their own way. Um, but, but the situation in cities is a little unusual in having these entirely African-American congregations. And of course, I should have said this earlier, the reason you have a white minister is because White people are, are deathly afraid of large numbers of black people congregating without white supervision. That's the bottom line. This is just, a, uh, you know, I did some mapping of, of, of different denominations across the state. It's fascinating. You know, I can, if I showed you a, a one of Lutherans, of course, the valley would be, <laughs> would be not the darkest part of it. Um, you know, obviously there, there are different ethnic groups that had different um, denominational affiliations. And of course, that was true here in Richmond. So um, you have St. Peter's, which is, of course, just a block away from St. Paul's Episcopal, which is uh, the cathedral in the antebellum period built in 1834. Um, and, and as you start to see more Irish and uh, German Catholic immigrants and Italians and other people, you start to see a fairly significant Catholic representation. Eventually, you have um, St. Mary's, which is a German Catholic church, which is in what we would call Jackson Ward now. Uh, and then you, of course, up on Church Hill, you have uh, St. Patrick's. So you start to see some differentiation by ethnic group. But this is a church that, that you know, a variety of different ethnic uh, peoples would have gone to who are, who are Catholic. Um, the other image is the old Beth Shalom a temple down in Shaco Bottom, which of course doesn't exist anymore. This was a Sephardic uh, congregation that merged with Beth Ahaba in 1898. And so there's, there was a significant Jewish presence in Richmond from the very beginning of the city. And so in many ways, some of the um, you know, Jewish families were really founding families of the city. Um, uh, you know, the, fa the famous Richmond in bygone days written by Samuel Mordecai. Uh, you know, uh, one of the most prominent Jewish citizens of the city uh, is, is really the classic uh, uh, um, period uh, writing about antebellum Richmond. So um, that's another interesting wrinkle in, in the city's history. Uh, there, there are several German Lutheran, uh, evangelical Lutheran congregations, uh, St. John's, which is now, of course, uh, at Stewart Circle. Let's talk a little bit about this notion of, of you know, and, and again, um, these are period usages. This is from the city directory in 1852. And uh, there was various terminology used for people, of, you know, free people of color or free Negroes, they were sometimes called. Essentially, these are people who in some, somewhere in their lineage had an emancipation of some sort or possibly were even born free. One of the things that happened in the 17th century in Virginia was that they, de they decided, I think for pretty obvious reasons, um, to attribute the status of the child to the mother rather than the father, and which it had been. So that's, that is put into, the, into code. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's established in the 1660s, basically. 
And what that means is if a white man has a child with an African-American woman, that child follows the status of the mother, which could mean they're enslaved, although it could mean they're free as well. So there's, there are uh, people who descend from, there are people who descend from free white women who um, had a child with an African or African-American. There are people who descend from Native Americans and there are actually suits in our collection of people of, that claim Indian descent on their mother's side and some of them actually win their cases and are declared to be free people. Um, some, of course, during, particularly during the era of the revolution, are emancipated. And there are some very large emancipations that happen. Uh, one of the most famous uh, ones is Robert Carter up on the Northern Neck, who liberates hundreds and hundreds of people based on his religious convictions. But it becomes harder and harder by law to emancipate as time goes on. Um, so you have this group of people who are neither enslaved, but they're not truly free like a white person is free. Um, they can't testify against a white person in court. They can own property and some, actually there are a few that own a lot of property. Um, they um, um, can't serve on a jury. Um, they can't vote. These are all things that that makes them have this kind of middle status. African-American barbers were kind of onto a class of their own in that they, particularly because they served mostly white clientele and, and many of them did attain economically uh, a lot of, you know, actually owned a lot of property and, and left, you know, sizable estates. Um, this is from the Exchange Hotel, uh, where, where some of the most uh, elite of these barbers would have uh, worked. Again, just to give you a sense of the proportion in the entire state, one of the most interesting parts of this is if you look at Accomack County on the Eastern Shore, right? There's a lot of free people of color up there, which is really fascinating. And of course, down in the Norfolk area, in the Hampton Roads area, Beersburg, Richmond. This was to, not to say there weren't um, free people of color in the counties, but it, it was more of an urban phenomena. That's where most of them would have resided. What about foreign born people? Well, this is a really easy one. You can see where they're living is primarily industrial areas. That one, uh, uh, place up in the little, um, um, you know, part of West Virginia that sticks up there is Wheeling, which is also a very industrial city. Um, you have the Richmond area, you have the Norfolk area. One of my favorite images. Uh, I think you can probably guess the ethnicity of, <laughs> of, of, of this child and his fa uh, father uh, because of the tartan. This is uh, Matthew Delaney and his son, and uh, he was Scottish, a Scottish machinist who worked at the Treasure Ironworks. Um, and he eventually was uh, a co-owner of the machine shops there with Joseph Reed Anderson. Um, the, these were very, very highly skilled workers. A wonderful, uh, I remember going to visit uh, Frank Williams, who was the last person to um, uh, run the Treader Ironworks, uh, which existed out in Chesterfield County until the eight, 1980s. And um, he had this beautiful, beautiful uh, silver uh, cup that as you can see was in, inscribed to another Scotsman, Charles Campbell, by the artisans of the Treader Foundry. These were men that were very, very proud of their work. Uh, you know, they really had a craftsman's mentality. And I love the little locomotive uh, beautifully done on this piece of silver. Again, going back to this theme of American city. Americans in the 19th century, and a lot of this came out of their religious convictions, were into all of these reform movements. One of them was temperance. Um, they 
it's, it's really actually quite remarkable. In the 18th century and before, yes, people understood that there were people who were drunkards, but nobody really decided that this was a societal issue that needed to be addressed um, uh, at any higher level. It's really the 19th century and the development of this particularly urban middle class that this issue comes to the fore. Women are really important to this movement. You can see down at the bottom, the woman and her child at the gravesite. You know, what you're seeing here is, the, is sort of the rise and decline of this gentleman as he becomes a drunkard and eventually, you know, kills himself with alcohol. And why are women key in this? Because they, they're the ones affected, <laughs> right? If your husband works at the mill and gets his pay and goes and spends it in a saloon, that's a problem. So this is a real problem. And, and temperance flows out of this. And you have organizations like the Sons of Temperance and the Washingtonians and that arise up to try to solve this problem. Totally an American thing. You, you could go to Philadelphia, New York, anywhere, Cincinnati, and you would be able to meet your brothers from the, from the uh, uh, Sons of Temperance. Interestingly, though, and boy, 19th century Americans are joiners. You know, they're joining things. They're join, joining the odd fellows. And, uh, and fraternal orders, we, can't, we don't even recognize the names anymore. Um, there's one called the Order of Redmen. And there's ones we don't even, you know, most of us never even heard of, but they love to join things. African Americans did too. This is a, 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 a constitution of a Union Burial Ground Society. See that very first name, Gilbert Hunt is one of the members. Um, most of these are pretty prominent um, free people on this document. So they started burying ground. You know, they, they, it's kind of like early insurance. Uh, the idea is that you will be able to have a certificate, you pay into it, and you will have a proper burial. This burial uh, site is now part of what we call the Barton Heights Cemetery. Actually, that cemetery is about seven different cemeteries, many of which are aligned with fraternal orders, like the Sons and Daughters of Ham, for instance, is one. Another movement that's happening in this period of time is colonization. This is a very complex thing. So the idea, depending on who you talk to in the 19th century and what period you're talking, is that, you know, one look at it is, and there are African Americans who, just as later, people like Marcus Garvey, who basically decide that Black people will never get a fair shake in America, so why not create a colony in Africa? And, and leave. And it happens in Liberia. That's how Liberia and Sierra Leone with the British get created. But there's a flip side to it. In the late 19th century and the late antebellum period, a lot of white people see this as a way to rid themselves of free people of color and start to advocate and even give state funds to fund people to be, uh, you know, to be taken. There are petitions from people in like Culpeper County saying, you know, the uh, free people of color are, you know, mostly indigent and they steal and they do this and that. Can't we just colonize them? So it's very different in the 1810s than it is in the 1850s. And I will say the same thing about religious groups. Rem you know, we all know that most of the Protestant denominations split into north and southern wings right around the 1840s, right? And it, it's pretty obvious why they do. And you start to see, particularly among Baptists, which is the body know the best, the development of a pro-slavery ideology around their religion. Somebody, you know, a Baptist in the 1810s would, ne would not have articulated this kind of a really pr very pro, not just slavery is kind of an evil that we have to live with because we don't know what else to do, it's like, no, it's part of the Bible, it's legit. And in fact, it's good for black people, essentially. Another kind of fraternalism that you see, and this is kind of, I have a whole chapter on this in my book, and it's 
to me at least, it's very fascinating. There are these militia companies like the Light Infantry Blues. Um, this is uh, these are like little men's clubs where they get together and they form these units that are part of what we would say today probably call the National Guard. Um, you know, they they are they are formal. They exist as part of the state apparatus. So they're not just like a bunch of guys running around the woods shooting at targets. Um, they have a structure and they have a command structure. But often when you join these, um, some of them are very ethnic. For instance, there is the Montgomery Guard, which is all Irish. And there are the German rifles who wear green hunting jackets. <laughs> so, so again, you see these very interesting cultural things going on along ethnic lines. This is, of course, one of the light infantry blues um, in front of the Capitol and the governor's mansion. One of the things that these militias do, and this gets us to the Civil War and kind of wrap things up, they are struggling with the schism between North and South. These guys are going to Philadelphia. They're going to events in Washington, Baltimore, New York City, and they're hanging out with their militia buddies and they're, and they're like saying, like you hear today, you know, like what's going on in the world? These people are crazy. You know, we have crazy people on the right and left and no center. Like, like we know who, what we're about. We trust each other. You know, we're the same kind of people. And, and um, they are in, in many ways trying to combine. It's very interesting. So they have these parades and they will have these toasts to Virginia, you know, the the uh, first among equals, because of course Virginians think they are, uh, uh, and, and they have the heritage, right? They have, uh, you know, Washington and Jefferson and everyone else. Um, but they always also will then toast the, the United States flag. And so they're trying to create a culture that combines the national and the local. And it is true before the Civil War that, you know, people do think of themselves in some ways as members of a state, although they recognize they're Americans, but that identity is pretty fluid. One of the funniest things I saw was the, um, the Montgomery Guard, the Irish unit, they love Washington. Well, why do they love Washington? Because he beat the British. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's kind of like no brainer, right? They love Washington. The, the Montgomery Guard guys. So these military companies are just fascinating. They also have ritual elements that are very similar to fraternal orders. One of the key moments in the late 1850s that brings all of this out is the raising of the Washington Monument in Capitol Square. You know, this is a moment where they're trying to build some kind of national unity around someone that everyone can get behind, Washington. And another important event, and that is the bringing of Monroe's remains back to Richmond to be reinterred in Hollywood Cemetery. And one of the really wonderful scenes of that is that this New York militia unit brings his body down on the boat and they land and they come ashore and they're, you know, they're, they're you know, um, doing the various obsequies around, around the reburial. And then they get together for this giant um, banquet on one of the levels of the Gallego Mills. And Henry Wise, the governor of Virginia, gets up and he says this, <laughs> which is kind of mind blowing. Wise is a fascinating guy. He's also, by the way, the person who um, interviewed and then hanged John Brown. Um, Wise, don't get me wrong, Wise is absolutely all about uh, maintaining enslavement, but he recognizes that if the South is going to be, and they're always looking to this, if, if something happens and they have to go on their own, they need the miners, they need the mechanics, they need the manufacturers, right? Um, and, and this is a South fulfilling prophecy. Because what happens when Virginia very reluctantly secedes in 1861? Where does the capital go? Richmond. Who makes half of all the armament for the Confederate Army? 
shredded ironworks? Who has the most railroad lines to move this material around? Virginia. It, Virginia becomes essentially the manufacturing center of this new country. So with that, let's talk and, and maybe we can uh, I'll be curious on your, your thoughts and um, hopefully I can answer your questions. All right, why don't we open it up for some Q&A. If you have a question, um, either wave or you might want to unmute yourself because I can only see so many at once. <laughs> so you might want to say, hey, I have a question. It's like crickets my, there. My pleasure. <laughs> and I'm sorry if I went a little too long there. No. No, it's fascinating. There's so much to cover. Mary Richie McGuire, I see you out there. <laughs> Mary Richie is one of our um, uh, historians. She's working on her. You want me to ask a question? Ask a question. I know you've got them. Yes, I do. Um, so um, thank you for a great talk, Dr. Kimball. I first met you years and years ago. Um, when I was a master's student at VCU with John Nebo in public history. I remember. So to prepare you for my um, question, um, I am now finishing up my dissertation, PhD in science technology studies at Virginia Tech. And I'm doing my dissertation on Benjamin Henry Latrobe. So I recognize those images, you. Um, my question is, and this is going to stump you, and if, and I don't, I don't mean to, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. Um, can you explain to the group um, how scientific, theological? and political ideas of race shaped slavery, not necessarily in Virginia broadly, but specifically in Richmond. Um, um, I can, I, obviously I, that is a tough question, but I think I have a couple things I could say about that. And they, they kind of lead me to the same irony that I guess went throughout my talk. And that is one of the really perverse things is, for instance, and I should have talked about the strike at Tredegar in 1847, which I meant to do. Um, one of the things Anne Joseph Reed Anderson, who was originally from Botetourt County and had experience with iron foundry work in that area, which made him a perfect person to come after he went to West Point to Tredegar, um, was that he was very confident, for instance, that, that, that enslaved people were, intelligent enough and skilled enough to replace these Welsh workers that, that he had. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that seems really perverse that he they thought that way, but he absolutely believed that. You know, he, he felt, and he also felt, not surprisingly, that it was absolutely his right as a slaveholder to do that. So in that sense, um, Richmond is, a, is an example where, um, uh, mass enslavers are really pushing the envelope of what they think an enslaved person can do. He, he, he has this one enslaved man who's a really good mechanic, but he keeps running into the, he keeps going downtown Richmond and going, you know, he'll come back eventually. So what, he, this is so weird and so perverse, but he sells them to a Louisiana planner so that he can install a sugar mill that, from Tredegar at this guy's plantation, and then he will keep him to run this mill, and he literally ships him with a machine. Um, you know, he, he doesn't have any sense that they're, they, they don't have the capacity to do this kind of labor, uh, which was considered, like I said, you know, about as high end as you could get. 
So that's that's one thing that strikes me as it's very weird. You know, it's not it's not the idea. It's not the vision of just kind of brute labor that you imagine people doing on plantations. I see Ed Jewett put his hand up. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, good evening. I've enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I, I'm curious about the immigrant population back in Antebellum, Richmond, and how it was increasing. Some of my family came to Midlothian to actually work in the coal industry back in the 1830s from England and Wales. Were the immigrants in Richmond mostly English speaking or were they mostly German or what, what was the makeup of that uh, immigrant population? Great question. Um, the majority, uh, the largest group definitely by 1860 were Irish. And uh, I say English speaking, but you have to remember <laughs> And I know this from documents, there were cases of people who did not speak English who came from Ireland. <laughs> um, uh, there was a woman who was assaulted uh, in Norfolk, for instance, uh, who didn't speak English. She spoke uh, 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 Irish. Um, yeah, I'll just say Irish. I know there's a lot of debate about it, whether it's Gaelic or not. Um, but I would say the majority are English speaking because you have the Irish and then you have, as I said, these highly the more skilled British workers. The next group we're going to definitely would be the German population. And of course there is no Germany, you know, in this period. Um, they are coming from all over Germany, uh, but not surprisingly, they're co particularly coming from agricultural areas where the economy is not great. Um, there is, there are a few documents, particularly civil war enlistments that actually give the state they come from rather than just say Germany. So there is some stuff in my book about that. So those are the big groups that are coming. Bill, you had raised your hand there. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> Got it. Um, when you mentioned the preponderance of barbers being, being black, um, did, did that include the surgical arts that, that the basically uh, 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 simple surgeries and bleedings and so forth was was a part of that. That's a fantastic question. And in fact, it did. There are ads for free uh, barbers in the city directories and they do leeching and cupping <laughs> as mm -hmm. part of their services. So yes, and that, that's a very good question. Uh, there's, there's not, uh, just as there, in some ways wasn't a huge difference uh, in, a, in British culture, uh, they do have those services, yes. Dr. Kimball, I'm wondering if um, you could expand at all upon um, the idea of indentured servitude as it relates to slavery, was what was indentured servitude like? Well, so now we're going just you know get set the scene. Now we're going if we're talking, for instance, you know, 17th century, which I think probably you're alluding to, and white indentures who are coming over as usually as headrights. So uh, someone will literally pay people's passage to the new world, and then they will be uh, have a service of so many years. Um, first of all, the biggest difference is, of course, it's a service for a period of years. It's not perpetual. Um, it is brutal. I, I mean, there's no way around it. Uh, ma uh, masters of, of uh, indentured people could be very brutal. Um, but I think the big difference, again, and this is something that is very tricky and evolves during the 17th century, that essentially where you get to fairly quickly is that the Africans are become life servitude, ownership of them. Uh, whereas the indentures, many of them went on actually to become fairly successful, own land, do all the things that, that Europeans wanted to do. It was the reason they came. Um, there's a, is a lot of confusion around that. You know, there's that whole Irish slaves thing out there, which just drives me nuts. And there are people that are much more expert on that than I am, uh, particularly in the Caribbean. 
one, that's a, one other important thing I should note. The vast majority of traffic of enslaved people in the, in the transatlantic slave trade did not come to North America. They went to Cuba and Barbados and Brazil. Less than 10% came to North America. Now, the conditions were such in these other places that literally people were literally worked to death. And so you had to replenish. And so, the, and there was not really the creation of a stable society um, uh, to the degree that there was at least in North America. So very quickly, North America's uh, population of enslaved people grew to be the dominant slave society by the 1860s. But it, it, that's kind of something that happens later. And it's important, I always point out, it's important to recognize the Atlantic slave trade and the internal domestic trade that we talked about are two completely different things happening in different periods of time with different dynamics. I wanna give the opportunity for one last question if there's one out there. Pam, do I see you raising your hand? Go ahead and unmute yourself. I thought this was absolutely fascinating and thank you so much. I, I just loved all the historical background about the economic powerhouse that Richmond was. I, I just had no inkling of all of that. Did I, have I heard you or did I hear you saying that you, Richmond is kind of uniquely uh, unique culturally in the way that it has dealt with this history? Um, probably I was trying to say, and maybe I didn't say it very well, that it, it has, unique is a word that historians probably like to avoid, even though I sometimes get take, carried away. <laughs> Richmond's pretty unique in this period. Like, it's pretty unusual to have a southern city that looks like this, okay? Um, as, as we have dealt with it, though, is another question. So, like, I, one thing that happened, I think, and is very classic in terms of the memory of enslavement and this period, is that you kind of get the moonlight and magnolia put, a, put across uh, things. And, you know, uh, think about the historic houses and the Wickham House and not to know, uh, believe me, I love the Valentine. They do a great job interpreting it. But, you know, there, there still was an emphasis and sort of if you, uh, there's this wonderful um, tourist film that, that's from, I think, the 50s that the Valentine has. It is like got Swanee River playing in the background. And, you know, it's like it shows all the iconic Confederate stuff. And, the, you know, it's, it's, it's totally Moonlight Magnolia. That's nothing like Richmond looked. All it's, it's just nothing has it has nothing to do with it. Um, so I think um, we still are a little delusional uh, sometimes about what what the city actually looked like in this period. One thing that does usually blow people's minds is the immigrant population. That's something that they don't expect. Um, so I don't know. We did. There's been a lot of debate, as you know, recently about. Of these textbooks that, we, that Virginians, I'm not a Virginian, so uh, I didn't read them, but I'm sure ours were just as bad. Um, but, you know, there's this 1950s uh, standard textbook that talks about how the slaves were treated very well. And, you know, I mean, I mean, there's, there's mythology that we all absorbed in our early life. And then I think, I do think the city right now and what you're doing is part of this is starting to really unravel a lot of this and look much more clearly at what this city's history actually is, both the good and the bad. So I'm excited. When I came here 35 years ago, and I'm a New Englander, so I know kind of about, you know, what's the right word, you know, tradition and how it bears down on you. But I thought, what did I do? <laughs> these, these folks, you know, call me a Yankee. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like, it's like, I didn't know the war was still happening, you know, which, and I, I totally get it, but I think we have made a lot of progress. We've got a lot more to make. 
But I think we are starting to recognize and to deal with our history in a much more important way. And I'll close by saying, so you don't think I'm just slagging on Virginians. I grew up with all kinds of myths. My father was a military man. I served in the army. I thought Robert E. Lee was a great, and Stonewall Jackson were godlike figures. They, because they were to my father. You know, the, we in the North reconciled, we were part of this equation, okay? So I, I think, I don't want it to sound like I'm bashing Southerners at all because all of us have these national myths and regional myths that we believe that often are just not so. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimball. I think if, if your your video is on and you want to clap, just, you know, <laughs> your jazz hands there. Thank you so much. This was such a uh, wonderful and interesting hour and a half that we got to spend with you. And we thank you so much. Well, thanks all of you for coming. Really, it's fantastic. And I applaud you for doing this work because I know it's hard. Um, but it, it's definitely worthwhile, and it sounds like you're well on your way to do something great. And if there's anything I can do for you, if you need to come here and do research, you know how to get in touch with me. Thank you so much. Okay. We will take you up on that. All right. I want to um, give a shout out for next week's speaker again is Dr. Ed Bond, and he will be talking about the history of the Episcopal Church in this time period, 1830 to 1865. And just like Dr. Kimball did, he will go a little bit earlier to lay some groundwork for us as well. He's a he's fascinating. He's taught at um, the School of Theology at Sewanee and at um, a, at an HBCU down in Mississippi where he now lives. So don't hesitate to tune in. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Also, if you're interested in learning more about this history, I encourage you to check out our Sacred Ground series. We still have room in one of our small groups if you would like to sign up. So thank you so much. Check out all that information in this Friday's eChimes. Thank, Thank you, you all again. For coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Loved it. Thank, Thank you much. You. Great evening. Thank you. Thank you.